Okay, so let's start with sample collection today. And if you hear weird Chewbacca noises in the background, that's just Cinder, my dog. It's not a person. Or if I randomly yell, <laughs> it's not the dog. <laughs> okay, so learning goals. Identify the types of cytological samples one might acquire. Identify the various types of sample collection and appropriate uses for each. Understand the pros and cons of the use of the procedure for each method of cytological sample collection and identify the various types of sample preparation and the methods for each. As we talk about sample collection, we'll try to stick to it as it specifically relates to cytology, although a number of these can also be used for parasitology uh, too. So some of them I'll talk about at the end of the lecture. So we have to start it off by thinking what sort of samples would we collect and why. Why are we collecting them? What's the purpose? What are we trying to acquire from them? Are we trying to identify if there's yeast and bacteria on the skin? Are we trying to identify if this wound that hasn't healed for um, three weeks has bacteria in it, if it has uh, resistant bacteria in it? So we have to know what, uh, what do we sample? What types of lesions do we sample? So the types that we'll talk about most and the ones that techs often uh, will be sampling, like our registered vet techs will be sampling, are discharge samples, so from the ears, from the nose, uh, mostly, well yeah, either, or, sorry, just ignore my backtracking, but nasal discharge is common or discharge from a wound, so uh, an infection, that kind of thing. Organ sampling is done either when the surgeon is in the body cavity looking at specific organs and taking a biopsy for themselves, then sometimes we will take a sample or create a slide of an organ, and I'll talk about how to a little bit later. Or it's if an organ's been removed or a biopsy has been done on that organ, and then we're making a cytological sample to look at the cells after. Lesions, various lesions, so... Um, Superficial lesions, deep lesions, lesions in general refer to masses, lumps, bumps, anything on the body. In that regard, put that down. No. And then fluid. And fluid, we commonly look at urine, which you've probably already learned about by now. I would hope you've learned about by now. Um, other types of fluid that we will look at would be thoracic fluid, abdominal fluid, or just fluid developing in any body cavity in particular. We'd want to see what type of cells are brewing. So then depending on what type of sample we need or where we're sampling it from, we're going to decide on how we take a sample from these areas. So we have, just a minute, we have scrapings, swabs, impressions, fine needle biopsy aspirate and fine needle biopsy non-aspirate. Now you'll probably catch me throughout this uh, PowerPoint, this lecture, just calling it either fine needle biopsy or fine needle aspirate. We tend to just call it an FNA whether or not we use the aspirate or non-aspirate technique. So just be aware of that before we start. I'll try to, to not mess it up, but sometimes it happens. So we'll talk about each one of these um, in depth on its own. So an impression technique. Impression techniques are very simple, easy to do, they're very cost effective, and they're non-invasive to the animal. So we can do an impression technique on a live uh, sample, so on an animal itself. And this one in particular, it looks like ears. I can't recall which one it is, in fact, but it does look like very, very um, dry, thickened skin of the ears, which is often associated with chronic yeast infections in the ears and skin. They get that really sort of elephant-looking thick skin. So this one's here on a live sample. And then this is on a sample that's been excised from the body, such as an organ or a piece of tissue. So common times that we would use them, use the impression technique, would be an ulcerative superficial lesion. So I always think, I'll show you a picture of one, but sort of an oozy, open wound that's sort of like a scrape or an abrasion that hasn't healed, and it's oozy, oozy and gooey. Tissue collected during surgery, um, or exudative superficial lesions. Sorry, the exudative superficial lesions are the one I was talking about where they're ooey and gooey. So ulcerative superficial lesions are where they're, they're just open open in general, not necessarily a lot of exudate or goo. So just switch those around. So the impression technique, and this is what we will be practicing in lab, 
first couple labs, or first lab at least. So on a live sample, so a superficial lesion, a fine needle biopsy should always be performed first to acquire the cells that are below this lesion. And we'll come back to this, we'll continuously come back to this, and especially when we're talking about superficial sample taking, because sometimes what we see on the surface when we collect a sample collection, or when we collect a sample to look at, what we see on the surface isn't always what's actually causing the lesion itself. So sometimes there could be another cause that's below the surface, whether it's cancer or a deep bedded infection uh, or chronic inflammation, and that's causing that superficial lesion to continue to look the way it looks. So we always recommend that you take a fine needle biopsy on an ulcerative lesion or a superficial lesion in general on the animal before acquiring a, an impression technique. Most often we don't, admittedly. Most often we'll just start with the impression technique, see if there's anything obvious, and go from there. So we often yield inflammatory cells when we're looking at um, an impression technique on a live animal. And don't worry, we'll talk all about impression or inflammatory cells in this course. So we often acquire a sample that shows us superficial inflammation. And that's just inflammation that's basically sitting very, very superficially mm -hmm. on the skin. Might also see bacteria as well. Um, best for determining if bacteria or fungal infection is present in this lesion. So in general, even if you have bacteria or fungus, often, especially if it's a sort of an ooey gooey sample or there's any sort of openness to it, it's not a dry sample, then you typically will see inflammatory cells and then also secondary bacteria and fungus. So that being said, it might not give you a, a specific cause of the lesion. Okay, always keep that in mind. It only provides you with um, the superficial, so what's on the outside. So it may only indicate the presence of a secondary bacterial function or infection or secondary inflammation. Okay, it might not actually tell you exactly why it's being caused or what's causing it. So for your technique, you would need a clean slide, a piece of gauze. So you would gently press the lesion, so dab the lesion against the middle of a clean glass slide and then take a secondary imprint so then you would clean the lesion so again just dabbing the lesion with saline and a clean gauze and take a second imprint with a new slide and the purpose of that is it gives you a comparative so when you actually take away just picture a bit of a wound where there's a bit of a, a goo to it <laughs> okay a bit of a discharge to it you'll get your first sample and that's going to show you what sometimes has been stuck to the goo, so from the outer environment it's getting stuck on the ins or onto that lesion it itself. So it shows you sort of a secondary bacterial or inflammatory reaction. If you take off that layer of discharge, you might be able to get a little bit more information. So more information about the actual cells involved in the lesion, or you might just continue to see bacteria and inflammatory cells. But we always do too, gives us a comparative, um, gives us sort of a before and after to see if after wiping off that discharge or sort of that, um, that junk, that goo that has developed on the outside of the lesion, if we wipe that off, maybe we'll see something else on the inside. That's the idea behind it. So this is an excellent one that you would do an impression technique. If you think about it, I mean, we do recommend doing the fine needle biopsy. But you can imagine why we often just go ahead and start with the impression technique in clinic because it's kind of tricky to tell the owner, yeah, we're just going to, you know, poke your cat in this open lesion on its face as the first step. So sometimes we'll just do a quick impression smear, see if there's anything obvious there and uh, go from there with the vet uh, to figure out what it could be and what sort of treatment the animal should get. So impression techniques. So surgically excised samples are a little bit different because you're not... Well, you're not working with a live animal, you're working with a piece of tissue that's been removed from the body, whether it's an organ, a uh, piece of skin tissue, etc. So the, this technique can be used to assess the cytological representation of the mass or organ sample in general. Histology is often performed hand-in-hand -hand with cytology, especially when it, well, generally always when it comes to surgically excised samples, because that yields the full diagnosis. Or ideally, that's, that's more likely to yield a full diagnosis. So the difference between the two, histology is when they're looking at tissue. Cytology is when we're looking at cells. So the limitations of cytology is that we have one slide with one section of cells on it. That's it. 
So we're looking at that particular population. So it's kind of like looking at a neighborhood within a city, one particular neighborhood, seeing how those cells are interacting with each other. Histology, on the other hand, they take that um, the tissue sample, they slice it, they put it under a microscope after they've dipped it in wax, and they view not only that little neighborhood of cells that we would probably yield on our cytological sample, but they're viewing how that neighborhood interacts with the entire town. Okay, so how those tiny little cells in that one little snapshot that we took with our cytology, how they interact with all the other cells around them. So thinking about if there is a cancer, if there is an inflammatory reaction, are those uh, cancer cells that we saw in cytology, are they invading other tissue? Are they taking over other tissue? Are they replicating themselves, etc.? So histology gives us a bigger picture of what's going on. So for a surgical sample impression technique, we will acquire the sample from the body cavity or from the body itself, depending what we're looking at. Cut the sample to expose a fresh area with a, a clean scalpel blade or clean uh, surgical scissors. Okay, so we want to expose a new area. Then we'll blot the sample gently on gauze, on sterile or uh, clean gauze. And then we'll gently make contact between the sample and the slide. And I have to admit, these are really fun to do. We'll do them in class, because you get to dab a piece of organ repeatedly on your slide. So the reason we cut the sample to expose a new side is to prevent us from taking a slide of any secondary bacteria uh, that might have, bacteria or otherwise, that might have stuck to our tissue sample in between the removal from the body and the placement on the slide. Okay, so we're reducing the chances of that. The reason we blot the sample is to reduce hemodilution. And hemodilution, as you can imagine just by the sounds of the words and the connection of the words, it's when blood is diluting your sample. So if we only have 60 little cancer cells in that area and we have this extremely bloody piece of liver, when we blot it onto the, or when we dab it onto the slide to get our cytological sample, if we don't get rid of some of that blood, you might not actually see those cancer cells, or you might only see a couple of them, a couple of the 62 cancer cells that might be present. Okay, so blood dilutes, and in most cases when we're looking at cytological samples, blood is an interference in our actual uh, sample. And then the dabbing onto the slide, main thing is be gentle, because if we're too firm with this tissue on the slide, we're going to wreck the cells, we'll rupture the cells. Okay, so if you have a look at this one, now this one, perhaps they did blot it and some tissue samples regardless, even after you blot it, they're still going to be extremely bloody. And that is the nature of that tissue, of that um, the disease process that's happening. That's okay, but we should always dab first, blot first. So you can see with this one, gloved hands, um, holding it with forceps, and just gently uh, dab your sample there, 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 and there on your slide to create a cytological sample. Scraping. So scraping is one that we can use on excised body tissue and also on living uh, samples as well, so on animals themselves. And the scraping can yield a ton of cells for us to look at. Likewise, just going back with the surgically excised samples or with um, the uh, impression technique. Sorry, that's what I'm trying to say. Impression technique in general yields a ton of cells onto your slide. So just keep that locked away in the back of your head because we'll come back to that. So scraping also yields lots of cells and it's typically, we most often use it on skin, but you can use it on excised organs as well to yield cells to look at for cytological changes. So it's ideal when we're looking at the skin, it's ideal for flat, dry, superficial lesions. Not ideal for identification of neoplasia. Can be used with samples collected from surgery, like I just mentioned and it can yield greater cellularity than that of impression smears. Okay, so this one yields a ton of cells. However, if we're doing this on a superficial area in the animal's body, similar to the impression technique, it may only indicate a secondary bacterial or fungal infection. Okay, so something that's come from the environment and just attached itself to the lesion itself. So just looking at the first point, <coughs> Ideal for flat, dry, superficial lesions. Again, another little image to, to put in the back of your head. Let me just go back to the, this guy. 
We would never really do an impression tech or a, a scraping technique on this cat's face. Okay, I know it's not a pretty fuzzy picture, but we would never do a scraping technique on this. As you can imagine, it's an open ulcerative exudative uh, wound lesion. So there's discharge. That tissue under the discharge is going to be extremely soft. So as you can imagine, applying a scalpel blade to that skin, to that lesion to acquire a sample, a, it's going to be very painful for that cat, so we don't want to inflict that much pain to an animal unnecessarily. And B, you're you're just you're going to get way too many cells. Okay, it's just going to sort of cut through that poor soft tissue like a knife going through butter. So that's not what we want necessarily. So your scraping technique. So just keep that in the back of your mind. We typically use it on skin that doesn't have exudate. Okay, no exudate. So you'll hold the scalpel blade on a 90 degree angle, pull across the tissue toward you, and just repeat this numerous times. You'll smear the sample onto the middle of a clean, dry slide. Now, keep in mind that with parasitology, we add oil at some point to the scalpel blade to put the oil onto the slide to get that dry, flaky material onto the slide. We don't use oil for cytology in this case because we're going to stain our sample. So if we try to put the oil into a stain, we're going to have some troubles. So don't use oil for cytology, only use the oil for parasitology. So you'll smear the sample onto the middle of a clean, dry slide. Um, it works very well if you scrape enough times to get a little bit of the, the sebaceous material, or the serum coming from the skin, so that your sample actually sticks to your slide. Okay, that's the idea of scraping across the skin numerous times. Okay, you can see here, there's scraping, so 90 degree angle, and just pulling that blade toward you across the skin. Uh, just going back, scraping technique, again, we also use this on excised organs, and it's the same, exactly the same technique. However, you only normally need to scrape once across, because like I mentioned before, you yield an excessive amount of cells, which doesn't smear very well onto a slide if you have too many cells. Next up we have swabs, and I will admit most of the times in clinic you'll probably see swabs when you're cleaning ears, and also when you're taking a sample for culture and sensitivity, in which case we would use a sterile swab. So otherwise, swabs, this one is a swab being used for vaginal cytology. We use swabs anytime we can't use the other techniques. So it's typically in orifices or fistulas. So areas where you're not going to stick a scalpel blade into, and you're not going to try to get an impression smear by sticking a smear, let's say in this case, into a dog's vulva. Okay, so we would use a, a swab. So it's when all other options are unavailable. Most often we use swabs for vaginal cytology, fistulas, so burrowing ho holes in an animal, sort of like a burrowing infection, and really commonly in the ear canal. Now, also like I mentioned before, we tend to use swabs when we're sending something away for culture and sensitivity. And culture and sensitivity, um, I'll just talk about it now what it is, often called CNS. It's when you use a sterile swab, and it comes. the sterile swab comes from the lab, and it has a culture medium in the bottom of the sterile swab. So I'll try. I'll bring some of these to class to look at these as well. So what you would do is take a swab of a sample, place that sterile swab into the little culture medium, so it's an agar, stick it into the agar, and then it's sent to the lab, and at the lab they create plates and they see which bacteria grows on these plates. Okay, so that's the culture. They're culturing the bacteria, or bacteria. <laughs> been watching too many yogurt commercials. They, they're culturing the bacteria. And then the sensitivity aspect of culture and sensitivity is when they drop little antibiotic um, discs onto the bacteria to see which antibiotic this particular bacteria is uh, susceptible to. So then you get a report saying it's this bacteria and you can use these common antibiotics. So you'll do those fairly often in clinic, especially with chronic infections, like chronic ear infections, should always be culturing and sensitivity in the sample in order to uh, for the vet to choose the right, the right antibiotic. That in itself will reduce antibiotic resistance if we choose the right antibiotic for the right bacteria and not just choosing a broad spectrum antibiotic. That's not up to us, that's up to the vets, but we should always be aware of that.
All right, so a sterile swab can be used, like I said, typically that's for culture and sensitivity. Otherwise, we typically just use any swab, but it has to be clean. You can't just use a swab that fell on the floor and then stick it in a dog's ear or vaginal area. So for most swab techniques, um, now that being said, I'll put a little uh, parentheses on that. For the swab techniques where it involves moist tissue, such as fistulas, such as eyes, sometimes we'll culture um, in and around the conjunctiva of the eye, or vaginal swabs, always moisten the swab with 0.9% saline. Okay, so just normal saline prior to collecting. If it's a regularly dry area, even if it's a, a little bit of a moist ear, we'll still typically just use a regular dry swab, um, specifically with the ear because we're dealing with wax and it would stick better to the swab itself. So the reason we use saline is so that we don't rupture the cells themselves. Um, swabs are extremely invasive to cells. If you think about, well, that's fine, but they're very invasive to cells. So the swabs themselves, especially with a little bit of pressure, they easily rupture cells. We tend to moisten it. It's also more comfortable for the animal, especially with vaginal cytology. So you'll acquire your swab sample, and um, we'll talk a little bit about this when we're talking about vaginal cytology. For ears, um, this best deserves a demo, but main thing with the ears is you're just trying to acquire some of the debris. And we always have to be cautious of using swabs in the ears to clean the ears out because it's really easy to, rather than pull the debris out with a swab, instead pack it deeper down into that L-shaped canal. So please be aware of that. If you're looking for cytology, all you're trying to do is gently place the swab into the ear and retrieve some of that debris that you're seeing. You don't need to jam it where you can't see it into the ear canal. Inappropriate. Okay, so you'll acquire the swab and then we'll gently roll it onto a clean glass slide. Keyword there, gently. Super gently roll it onto a clean glass slide. And we'll have a look at this in, in lab. Okay, so this is, oh, I didn't know I had a picture. How fabulous. This is the sterile swab and the little gel agar. So that's used for culture and sensitivity, just as an aside. All right, so now we're going to move into the more advanced form of sample collection and it's called fine needle biopsy, and there are two types. Now, I'll preface this conversation with the fact that most of the time, it's the, the veterinarian who's acquiring the fine needle biopsy. Depending what we're taking a fine needle biopsy from, the animal may be awake, or the animal may be sedated, they may need local anesthetic, and they may be under general anesthetic. It all depends on the nature of what we're sampling and the location. If you think about taking a sample of a lump around the eye, <laughs> not many dogs are going to sit there without sedation or without local and have look at a needle coming toward their eye and, and be okay with that. So sometimes we put them under general anesthetic or sedate them for these. But just so you know, most often in most clinics, it's the veterinarian that performs the fine needle. However, we need to know the basics of it. Um, I've done it before in practice on patients. So... It's a skill that you need to know, but don't be offended if, uh, if the vet always goes to do it. So we have, here, pooch. we have the aspirate technique and we have the non-aspirate technique. So if you think about it, aspirate is we're actually aspirating cells into the needle itself. Non-aspirate is we're allowing the flow of the cells to move themselves into the cells uh, with movement rather than with aspirating them. So for the aspirate technique, we're applying negative pressure to the syringe in order to collect the sample. Non-aspirate, no negative pressure. Stop that. Come back. Alright, so supplies. You need a 22 to 25 gauge needle, a 3cc to a 20cc syringe, and just a note, the softer the tissue, the smaller the needle gauge. Likewise, the softer the tissue, the smaller the syringe. Specific fine needle biopsy aspirate technique. <clears throat> the supplies that you'll need are, again, softer tissues, smaller syringe, so like a 3cc syringe. 3cc tends to be the minimum syringe in order to acquire an aspiration. 1cc syringes don't really create enough negative pressure. I find they're too small. So firm tissues, you can use a larger syringe to maintain adequate negative pressure. pressure up to a 20cc. 
If it's unknown or if it's mixed consistency, then a 12 uh, cc syringe is a good choice. Okay, so preparation, sorry, I flipped there. Preparation for the sample. I don't know if you can hear my dog in the background. She's making crazy noises. So preparation for your lesion. So for, and I say lesion, I'm also referring to masses. So a lump, a bump. Preparation would be the same as it would be for vaccines. So sometimes we use alcohol. Sometimes we don't use anything. If a culture and sensitivity is required, then a surgical prep can be applied. Or if there's a good chance of introducing bacteria into a sterile area, um, I can't think of an example, then you might use a surgical technique. A surgical prep technique, sorry. So, how to. Base the needle gauge and syringe size on the mass consistency. Stabilize the mass with your fingers. Introduce the needle to the middle of the mass, okay, middle specifically. Withdraw the plunger of the syringe, three quarters the volume of the syringe, approximately. And then repeatedly pass the needle through two thirds the diameter of the mass. So you just sort of gently move your needle around within the mass. Release the negative pressure before each redirect. And then you'll gently release the negative pressure. So you'll gently release the pressure created when you pull the plunger of the syringe um, and remove the needle from the mass. So when you're removing the needle and syringe from the mass, make sure you don't, you aren't still pulling on the plunger. Because what's going to happen is all those beautiful little tiny cells that you collected that you only want to collect in the needle, all those cells you're going to hear and they're going to get shot up into the syringe and you'll never be able to put them on a slide. So release negative pressure before you come out of that mass. So then you'll remove the needle from the syringe, draw air into the syringe, replace the needle and apply the sample to a slide. So non-aspirate technique. Again, base the needle gauge on the mass consistency. Fill the syringe with air. Attach the needle. Stabilize the mass with your fingers. Grasp the syringe at or near the hub, kind of like a dart. Insert the needle into the mass. Move back and forth repeatedly in different directions. Again, covering two thirds of the diameter of the mass with your needle pokes. Um, and keep, keep your needle inserted into the middle of the mass. Okay, don't go too superficially and don't go too deep. Immediately apply pressure to the syringe, oh, sorry, remove the needle from the mass. And then you'll hover your needle and syringe over your slide and apply pressure to the syringe to expel the sample onto the slide. Don't worry, I'll give you demos of all of these. <laughs> so some tips when you're completing or when you're doing a fine needle biopsy. Avoid peripheral blood dilution. So if, come here, pop. If, uh, when you're taking your sample, you notice that there is blood in the hub of your needle, especially with an aspirate technique, you'll probably notice this more so than a non-aspirate technique. If you're noticing quite a bit of blood in the hub of the needle or even creeping into the syringe itself, you need to start again. I would definitely make a slide of that sample. It will be hemodiluted, but you still might see some cells that you might not see on the next one. So always don't ever waste samples, but you do need to start again and take a fresh sample. It probably means that you either have a sample, which um, your mass might be a type of malignant cancer that regardless is going to be very friable and it's going to be very vascular, um, uh, has a high level of vasculature. So it's going to be bloody regardless, uh, no matter how many times you try this. Or you've entered an area where you've pricked a capillary and you're getting hemodilution because of that. So always collect two to three samples if the lesion size permits it. Okay, these samples are super valuable, so don't ever waste them. If you take two to three and you're like, oh, I can't see any cells, of course you can't see any cells. We can't see cells without a microscope. And the cells should all be in your needle. So don't ever waste it and assume that you didn't get a good sample. Make a quick slide, stain it, look at it.
take from numerous places within the mass to provide a representative sample. Okay, so that's using two-thirds the diameter of the mass. Don't just stick to the middle and not move your needle around. Always take within the whole mass. And don't be timid with your technique, but do be quick. Okay, you are poking an animal. It's invasive, so do be quick. Um, if you have no cells, so if you've expelled your sample onto your slide and it seems that you have no cells, still prepare it still uh, stain it and look at it, but you may want to take a secondary sample. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about preparing your sample because, well, just in general, and then I'll go back to some more collection techniques toward the end. You'll see the color of the slides change. I just merged a couple PowerPoints together. So preparing your sample, your technique's going to depend on the viscosity and cellularity of your sample. As soon as the sample is collected, I can't stress this enough, don't wait, especially with a fine needle biopsy, but as soon as your sample is collected, you have to start preparing your slide. Again, especially with a, a fine needle biopsy, because with a fine needle biopsy, your tiny, tiny, tiny little cells are in the needle. They're in the needle itself. So if you leave those for five minutes, and let's say you've got 50 cells, and that's it, and no fluid protecting them, those tiny little cells are going to dry out and disappear and then you won't be able to get them out of your needle. So you'll waste that whole technique. Nobody will be happy with you. <laughs> so different techniques. We have the squash prep, which is my total favorite. It's super easy. Um, it's the best technique for solid tissue samples or mixed samples. So when you're trying to get rid of some of the lumps and bumps, sort of spread out chunks within your sample, um, or if there's also fluid, then you're getting a good mixed sample by doing a squash prep. Main thing with your squash technique, and we'll talk about it, you can't squash. You can't actually squash your sample down against two slides together because you'll wreck your cells. So it's just gently laying one slide on top of the other and pulling down. So then we have the blood or wedge uh, technique, ideal for samples with low viscosity, so thin samples, it's ideal. Ideal to stop the smear abruptly at one end to actually create a line smear. Okay, so this is, uh, let's say that the drop of blood is where this person's finger is, they've moved the blood across, and then you stop it at one end specifically so that you get a nice area where it's spread out cells, but then one little line of accumulated cells, or accumulation of cells. So it can be used for liquid samples with low cellularity. I already, no, I didn't say that. Okay, the misnomer technically should belong here with the squash technique. I don't know why there's a random, I, that's an editing, that's me. <laughs> so misnomer, squash, that's what I was saying, you don't actually squash yourselves. All right, starfish technique. Clearly, I don't have a picture of the starfish technique. It doesn't quite look like this. But it's good for samples where you want to leave a thick layer of fluid or where a thick layer of fluid is left around the cells. So it's also good for mixed consistency, so those chunky sort of pus samples. Because again, you're leaving a little bit of a thick layer of fluid around your cells, but you're drawing the cells out of the sample in the middle of your slide. And I'll show you the starfish technique. All you're doing is applying your sample into the middle of the slide and then taking a needle and pulling out little starfish legs from it. So here's the squash technique. There are two variations. Actually, there are almost three. So there's a squash and drag. Okay, so the sample is on uh, the vertical slide there. Place one slide on top of the other and drag off. And there's also one where you squash and spin. And that one helps flare it out a little bit more. Uh, that being said, I'll show you another technique in class where I lay both slides in this direction and then you actually end up with two squash technique slides so you get two for one that you can stain and look at. So the wedge, blood, or line smear same as your blood um, you can do it right to the end of the slide and leave a feathered edge the way you would a blood smear or if it's really thin sample with very few cells you're, you're suspecting there are very few th cells so if it's a clear thin sample then you'll want to leave a line at the end so you'll stop abruptly to leave a line, so accumulation of cells at the end. Here's your starfish. So you apply your sample into the middle of the slide, and then you just have some fun and draw out various starfish legs from your needle itself, or with your needle. There is also a combination technique, and this one's kind of cool. I'll get you to practice this too. And in this one, you are leaving a clump 
of sample as is in the middle, so that's number two. You're creating a line smear, or sorry, either a line smear or a blood smear with sample three. And sample one, you're doing a squash prep. So you're getting all three, so that if you have a variation in the consistency of your cells, or you don't know how many cells are going to be on your sample, you give yourself the best odds of identifying cells. Okay, so those were the actual preparations. Um, and then these are a couple more ways that we can look at cells as well. Or sorry, uh, collect samples. So the tape. Tape we often use for parasites. Calatiella, um, that walking dandruff parasite, we often use it for that more so than cytology. But we can use tape, especially on skin that is extremely dry. So remember when if we go way back to that picture of that ear, that really dry, thickened skin, often old yeasty skin, we can use tape to look for yeast and tape to look for bacteria. Really great, it's non-invasive, little preparation required. The only thing I don't love about this is trying to stain it. Because with cytology, as you can imagine, we have to stain the samples in order to actually see the cells. So once you take a sample with tape, and place that clear tape onto your slide, I still would encourage you to do the three-step stain prep, so the three-step prep, but it is quite difficult for that stain to get into um, all this, the areas underneath your, your tape itself. So that's just my own little thing. I'm not a huge fan of the tape technique, but sometimes it's helpful. So punch biopsy, we'll practice this in class. They're super fun to do. Admittedly, we don't often do them. It's typically the veterinarian that does them. It, I, it's not technically considered a minor surgical technique. It's more, it's similar to a fine needle biopsy though. So just keep in mind, the veterinarian often does these ones rather than us. So it's fast, it's easy. Um, it typically often requires sedation or anesthetic or at least local anesthetic. Again, depending on where you're taking this little core sample from. Samples are large enough for pathology. So again, you're taking, you have this little instrument with a handle on it. And this is a circular blade. So what you're doing is inserting the circular blade typically into the skin. We use it often for skin, but it can be used on excised organs as well. Typically into the skin and then twisting it into there, into the skin, into the layers. And what you end up with is a little core sample of the tissue that you've, you've removed. Okay, so these are the punch biopsy tools. This one's the most common. It's uh, disposable. Just keep in mind, it is disposable. I have worked at clinics where they repeatedly reuse these. Just think about the dullness of the blade, okay? Um, they are disposable, and they're, ex they're not expensive. <laughs> they're like three bucks to buy. So just keep that in mind. If you're using disposables, they technically really need to be one use only. And this is the technique. So you have a lesion, lump, bump, whatever it might be. Um, depending, again, oftentimes we clean it, either with a surgical prep or just alcohol. Enter the punch biopsy into the skin push down, twist, and a tiny little core sample is removed. Let me just see here, see if I can open this. Oh, Sorry, I don't have that technique, but we can look it up on YouTube as well. I should update that. Sorry about that. I'll find another, another video for this. All right, so then... Moving on, so with your uh, punch biopsy, so we would send the core sample, typically we send it off for histology, but we can also make some nice, um, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember, impression. We can make some nice impression slides with the little core sample before we send it off. Centesis, you'll learn how to do this in Med 400, so we typically... Most often we think of cystocentesis where we draw fluid from the bladder, but as techs, again, you're often involved with thoracic, thoracic, thoracocentesis and abdominocentesis, and then there's also all sorts of other types of centesis that you might be involved with. It's typically the veterinarian that performs these, but we would be in charge of handling the sample and preparing the slides. Okay, all sorts of centesis. So thoracocentesis, pericardiocentesis, abdominocentesis,
cystocentesis, arthrocentesis, etc., etc. It's anywhere in a body cavity that fluid has accumulated. And I do have a video. I haven't checked these videos, though. I should have. Oh, it's going into mail. Nope, no idea what just happened. Just ignore all this. <laughs> God, go away, mail. Okay, well, you can click on that hyperlink <laughs> in your own time because it's not going to work for me at this moment. So have a look at the hyperlink. I'll double check that it actually is a hyperlink. So then, synthesis, it's typically, just some notes about it, it's typically a fast procedure. Avoid superficial contamination, right? Because you're passing the needle directly into a cavity. So you're really getting the root of the cause, or at least you're getting the direct sample that you need. So you're getting the fluid itself, which can indicate inflammation, bacteria, cancer, etc. But you're not getting superficial contamination of bacteria or yeast. You can obtain really large samples, okay, if you think about the fluid. Maintenance of surgical sterility can ensure access to isolated areas, such as arthrocentesis, thoracocentesis, plus or minus sedation, depending on what you're sampling and the animal itself. For thoracocentesis and abdominocentesis, most time the animals are sick, they're lethargic, they can't breathe if they have fluid in their thorax, and most often you don't need to sedate these animals. Okay, they're so sick that they just need this performed to remove a lot of the fluid, and then they can breathe and remove and whatnot. So it is invasive, might be tolerated, just depends. I'm not even going to try to click on this hyperlink, but you guys can on your PowerPoint. All right, another type of sample collection is combing and toothbrush technique. Again, this one is, uh, combing in particular is more for parasitology, I find, for looking, that in itself is looking at flea dirt. Okay, little flea, flea poops. So combing a toothbrush technique, especially the toothbrush technique, I'll have a look at that in a minute, but you can use that to collect cytology, um, again, yeasty skin or oral. It's kind of nice for oral use as well. So to remove cells, skin cells from the oral cavity, and I'll show you a picture of that. This is called scurf. So that material that you acquire by um, sort of scratching up an animal's coat with a comb or a toothbrush and you're really getting the superficial layer of epithelial cells, those really thin dry epithelial cells, and a layer of hair. It's called scurf, just as an aside. And in here we have hair and fleas, flea dirt. So here's the toothbrush technique. Don't mind, this is actually a human. It's used often to acquire human cytology from the oral cavity. We can also use it with animals. Um, it's not one that we use often though. Okay, it's just an option to acquire a cellular sample. So you would literally uh, brush the toothbrush onto the area of cytological interest and then gently dab it onto the slide. Lastly, we have plucking. Now plucking we do use um, fairly often for dermatophytes. So looking at little fungal hyphae and dermatophytes that are growing within the the origin of the hair. So cytologically, plucking is definitely <clears throat> valuable to us. And we also use it to send a sample away for culture and sensitivity or a sample away for dermatophyte testing in the agar as well. So it's required specifically to isolate derm dermatophytes um, or to perform culture and sensitivity. It's excellent when parasites are suspected, especially any that are stuck to the follicle of the hair but we're not going to talk about parasites in this class. And then I do, I do actually have a video for this one, which is really great. <laughs> this is the true technique for hair plucking that was discovered by a bird. If it loads. <laughs> Gets me every time. So this is a hair plucking technique. The titmouse has it pretty well down pat. You're grasping hair right at the root in order to acquire a follicle sample and then packaging it appropriately for the lab or creating a sample onto a slide. And this little titmouse, there's a bit of a titmouse epidemic on hair plucking across the world because I found three videos which I've attached to your cytology video, YouTube videos. This one has really crazy music. I'm just gonna go like that. See, another little titmouse. Look at him hanging out just taking away that hair 
plucking it from this old sad dog. And yet again, a titmouse who's very interested in cytology. He just wants to get that hair follicle sample. These little guys are so helpful. All right, that is it for sample collection and preparation.